OK. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nikhil. I am former PTL of Glance. And uh, I have experience uh, mentoring some outreach interns as well as new developers in the project. And I've collaborated with uh, new developers um, who incubated different projects when Big Tent was a really big thing in OpenStack. And we were, um, we actually had two decently big uh, projects uh, evolved out of Glance and became successful ones. So um, we'll try to share as much experience based on, uh, based on those um, historical um, aspects of OpenStack and share with you guys. Yeah, I'm Brian Rossmeda. I'm the current PTL of Glance. So I've had a lot of experience reviewing code and interacting with uh, developers who want to work on projects. So hopefully you'll all want to submit some patches to Glance um, by the time we're done today. All right, let's get started. So um, first things first is, you know, if I want to contribute to OpenStack, how do I exactly go doing that? What is, what is the first baby step I need to take, right? Um, you can use different platforms. You, you must have uh, observed there is an Upstream Institute. They had a couple of, session, a couple of days of sessions uh, at the summit. And there, there is a dedicated mentoring pl uh, platform. Then uh, for underrepresented as well as women in technology, there is a, a separate um, program that goes for all of the open source, which is called Outreach. Op OpenStack has good history of collaboration. Um, there and we we have I think about a dozen uh, interns or or more um, so far so uh, that's that's one thing to look out for if you can um, join in then Google Summer of Code is one uh, is a program that we join um, uh, on and off depending on how much interest we get and how much uh, outreach interns are joining us so that's one thing that you can potentially target if you have a good project in mind that's that's definitely welcome. Then women of OpenStack do have lots of um, you know training sessions on contribution. So, so that's probably the first thing to look out for. Besides that, you can get in touch with any of the developers, and then they'll be happy to get you introduced. Um, but how, um, what, what you need to do? We can talk about this in the further slide. So, um, how many people went to the Upstream Institute uh, earlier this week? Okay, just a few. Okay, so the, the advantage of the Upstream Institute is there some sort of like paperwork kind of things you have to do. You have to sign a, an agreement with the foundation for your code. And then you, you just have to get familiar with the basic processes of using Git to um, you know, create a local repository so you can fix your patch, and then using Git review to upload it so that it'll be reviewed. Um, and so that's, that's why that's useful. And then these other, these other projects, so if you only do the Upstream Institute, you can just jump into uh, one of the projects if you're interested, um, but you won't have a formal mentor. So it'd be up to you to sort of interact with the, uh, the people. And we'll talk about good places to interact in a second. So uh, we will highly recommend starting small. Um, even if you are you know, a champion in different open source project, OpenStack has its own quirks. and. Uh, uh, the, the best thing is to get yourself a feel of dif different projects, a feel of the community, and individual projects, and how people are working there. So you can choose a project or choose different projects, uh, try to jump in, um, and um, see how things are going there. And then you can maybe zoom into one of the projects. Yeah, just pick a project based on your interests. So if you're interested in image cataloging and delivery, you know, Glance is a great project to work on. Nova is pretty enormous, so there's a lot of stuff to do in there. Um, but if you're interested in authorization or authentication stuff, there's Keystone. So just, right, there's, there's a lot of projects. So just pick one that matches your interest, and then you can find something to work on in there. Yeah, and we do have some libraries that people can work on. It's generally easier to get code into, merge into a library than into a server, because just in terms of stability, the server needs to be a little slower in terms of the pipeline. So, right. So, um, you know, th there's a good documentation available. Um, you, for developers, I would recommend you know definitely going through the dev manual and 
making sure that you're familiar with um, you know the agreements and the different kinds of accounts that you're going to need and uh, you know joining the foundation is mandatory so that's one thing um, there is a special uh, repository so that folks can test out their uh, the, the accounts and the setup it's a, it's a throwaway uh, commit basically if you use uh, if you commit anything to that so um, all you basically need to do is just add a line then do the regular git stuff uh, put up a review and then you know make sure that uh, everything's working sometimes people have issues with their proxies sometimes um, you know uh, the sh keys don't work so stuff like that can be you know easily figured out with uh, sandbox environment versus trying to go into a project and then um, right so all the projects have lists of bugs on Launchpad, so you can go through and see what the bugs are. Some will be enormously complicated, some will be smaller. Um, so page through, find something you're interested in. Key thing is to make sure you assign yourself to the bug, because OpenStack as a whole is so distributed. There are people, people working on OpenStack 24 hours a day, just in various time zones. So if you don't assign yourself to the bug, somebody else doing the same thing might also Sign the bug to them. Well, not assign the bug. Might work on it, and then <laughs> submit a patch, and then we have duplicate patches, and it's a waste of effort. Yes. So, coding in Python, C, C++, which, which is Oh, yeah, it's pretty much Python, okay. um, and you don't get much choice as a bug fixer because you got to work with the language that's there. Um, but yeah, there's pretty so, much yeah. exclusively Python code. There, there's been some movement towards Go. Um, right. in Swift, um, and then there was some, one other project that was using something else, but it's pretty much a Python kind of shop. And the, Python was chosen because it um, has some nice features as far as being easily readable, and the idea was that the code's gonna be read by lots more people than write it, so that was the main reason for Python. Um, and the community is pretty gung-ho for <laughs> Python. So. Right, you have to, and um, to help you with that, some of the uh, tests that your code has to go through will check for style, check for indentation, check for the imports being proper. So you'll get some assistance that way also. But yeah, so it's, right, so Python, just if you haven't used it before, um, I guess the, there's some good online tutorials. There's, what's the one, that, learn Python the hard way or something? There's something so, called, yeah. it's learn Python the hard way, I think. Okay, so that's a good online thing you can just go through real quickly to just sort of brush up on your Python. Um, but yeah, you'll be writing Python if you fix bugs right. in OpenStack. Mostly, and maybe bash scripts and stuff like that. For that's true, there's some bash scripts. Yeah, and if you work with uh, DevStack, so DevStack. DevStack and There's a change in DevStack stuff. recently for it to run as a service, but um, I think it's mostly it's bash mostly that bash sets, sets up yeah. DevStack. Um, and that's, that's a place where you might want to contribute. That's another interesting project. Um, and that, you know, I personally tend to focus on the ones that have APIs because they're the, the sexy projects. But there's infra <laughs> and uh, DevStack. Those are all really important things because there's a lot of tooling that keeps OpenStack running. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, there's always room to work. And people are always finding bugs in some of the infrastructure. So another good place to work. Yeah, if you're, open, if you're an OpenStack user, you can also try contributing to the SDKs. Like they do have Java SDKs and stuff like that. So maybe you can start with the client and then find your way through the Python code as well. All right. So easy to miss. Um, so please remember, we are a community. We are not a enterprise. So there's a difference uh, that you would find in the culture. You would, you know, you would make friends and then you would, you know, just uh, express yourself, if you may, through the code. So, you know, pick your, pick your interests, what suits you the best, and um, try to make sure that you have an impact that you love. So, you know, start, st starting that, st <laughs> going through that is, you know, making sure that you have uh, uh, sort of right orientation for the project, and, uh, you know, you sort of meet somebody at the summit, um, you know, get involved that way. But the, I guess your first 
um, involvement in a project would be at the weekly meeting. So all the projects have weekly meetings, and some of the bigger projects will have sub subgroup meetings. So at the, at the start of every meeting, there's usually a roll call, so you can just say hi. And then after the meeting, you can go into the, uh, the channel for the specific project if you want and introduce yourself or say hello to somebody. Um, it's a good way to just get known because you're going to rely on people reviewing your code in order for it to get merged. So it's best to try to have some kind of relationship. And also, you'll need some help from people. There'll be weird things that'll come up where somebody who's more experienced can help answer some questions. Um, so, and it, as Nikhil said, it's a community. So we like to see new people show up <laughs> and take an interest in the projects. So. What do you use to uh, meet? Oh, it's all on IRC. IRC. Yeah, so, and so each, um, so basically the way it's set up, all the projects have their own IRC channel. Um, so like OpenStack, Dash Glance for the project we work mostly on. Um, and those, I think all of them now are logged. I don't think there's a choice. So yeah. there's a way you can, you can sort of review discussions that have happened out of your time zone if you need to. But you should also just be aware that they're logged just so that whatever you say in there <laughs> is preserved for posterity. And then the meetings will be held, or usually held in one of the OpenStack meeting channels, not in the, in the project channel. And those are also logged. Um, and the transcripts of those, if you, if you just do a Google search for OpenStack meetings, it sh should take you to the wiki page um, that'll have the list of all the meetings, all the channels. Um, each group tends to handle their agendas slightly differently. Some keep them in the wiki, um, some keep them in etherpads, but the, uh, the, ba the main meetings page yeah. should lay out exactly uh, what each project does. So it'll give you the time, where to connect, and, uh, but it's all in IRC, so everybody's communicating by typing. Um, and it's uh, eavesdrop.openstack.org, and you can just you know, find everything on that one page. No, so what's, it's a, it's a it's weird, a it's, a, it's, a, it's yeah, it's sort of evolved. There was like an OpenStack meeting, and then there's OpenStack meeting two, and then OpenStack meeting three, and OpenStack meeting four, because there were you know, time conflict. And <laughs> there is some an OpenStack meeting too, that's a weird part. It's an OpenStack meeting okay. alt. <laughs> right, <laughs> and that's then right though, okay. So there, there are, no, so, so to answer your question, no, there, there are several different channels where it could be, so you really do need to check, because you can't yeah. really guess where it's gonna be. And one or two of the groups have their own Yeah, operators have channel. their, yeah, so. so they have their meetings in their own channel, stuff like that. So it's, a, it's a pretty wide open community yeah. and with a lot of free spirits, so almost every project. We, we all sort of observe the same basic tenets, but do things in different ways where it's not essential and right. makes it kind of uh, interesting. Yeah, I guess the, you know, to generalize this a little bit more, I would say we have a common culture. So OpenStack has its own way of doing things, but we don't have a definite system or uh, specifics of how we do things. So you would find that, you know, all the meetings happen on IRC, but then don't necessarily happen on the same the same way or the same amount of time or how they are logged or uh, how they are handled, operate, administered, if you may. So, yeah. All right, so coming back to the slides, um, uh, if you're picking up a bug, just make sure that you are looking at all the metadata on the bug, like if it's not a too old bug, if the bug is a couple of years, of, uh, a couple of years old, it, it's a good possibility that you won't uh, see that bug uh, anymore. Yeah, or, some, some projects are better about closing out old bugs that are no longer applicable than others. Like, yeah. Glance isn't that good about doing it, I gotta admit. Um, so, it's, so it's good to just read through the bug real quickly, make, make sure you, you see which release it applies to, because right. it's applying, to, there's some old bugs that were never fixed um, that apply to old releases that are out of life. So you don't wanna have to work on one of those. Although you could test to see if it's still yeah. relevant. If you're an operator and if, you, if you're still seeing the bug, you might want to test it out on a particular release that you're operating and then you know, comment on the bug saying that you still see the issue and somebody should be able to help you. All right, um, so the best way to test a bug is to use a dev stack. Well, you could potentially install individual projects by, a, by scratch, but it's just, so much easier to have a virtual machine that 
you know, just git clone dev stack and run the script and then you, you have all the projects running and then you can easily test out. Has, uh, has anyone here used dev stack before? So just a few, okay. okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, a great, it's a great tool. I mean, because it just, you just crank it up, it, ins it installs everything for you and you've got a full working open stack in your laptop or I tend to use it in a VM so I can just throw it away and it doesn't mess up my laptop. But however, however you want to do it, it's a really useful thing. And then you have access to all the logs. You can, you can see what's happening with all the, uh, anything you're trying to fix. And you can fix, fix the code right there because you'll have it available to you in a Git repository. And you can try out your bug tests right in DevStack live. Um, so it's really good for reproducing a bug because sometimes people will file bugs but won't leave complete reports. Um, so it's good to test it out and verify that what they, the behavior they've seen is reproducible before you start trying to fix, fix something. Yeah, just be mindful about, about the release that you're testing. So, you know, the bug may be applicable to Metaka, but not, say, Pike. And uh, you may see responses differently for different releases. So you want to say, you know, this is, this is the release I'm tra trying, testing this out on. The, the request body as well as the response body. And you know, if, you, if you have any logs that are super helpful, if you have log, it's, uh, you know, it's probably a sure shot that some reviewer is gonna triage that bug and give you good points on it. So. Yeah, and with DevStack, you can check out a specific branch if you need to. So if you right. need to, to if you wanna work on a- or your own branch. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah, I mean, as, as a start, you know, DevStack is good to start with. But it, right, for if you're using, so with DevStack, it'll set up my SQL. So if you're not using that in production, you might be seeing something different. So it's all, I think um, our advice is just make sure you can reproduce the bug yourself before you start working on it. Right. So if you've reported it yourself, then you're, you're set, you know exactly what the environment is. Um, but if you're picking up a bug from someone else, it's, I mean, as a start, DevStack's an easy setup where you've got everything available, so that's why I'd start there. But also, reading through the bug, if they, if they so if, for instance, if they're observing it with, my, with uh, Postgres or something, then you're not gonna be able to, to do it in DevStack. It would be something else. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if you have a bug that's, that has some mis missing information that you have found, please add it. Um, you depending on the criticality of the bug, you get karma points on Launchpad, and you can see the activity on Launchpad of who's working on what and stuff like that. So it's just a you know, good way of getting involved. If you're an independent developer, that's uh, one way to get um, highlighted. And you also on the bug, you can, um, the person who filed the bug, we usually get email when people right. leave comments. So if, if you can't reproduce it, you can just politely say something. I can't reproduce this can you give me some more information? Or you could ask if they're still seeing it because sometimes there are these transient bugs that, that come and go. So the, the main thing is all our communication in OpenStack is, not all of it, but mostly it's asynchronous because we're distributed so widely. So you need to have these conversations. So if, if you do take the, t so one thing you wanna do is right, make use of your time. So if you've spent some time looking at a bug and you can't reproduce it, don't just move on. Put a note in the bug just saying, I tried to reproduce this you know, today using this dev stack and I wasn't able to do it. Can you give me some more information or something? And that'll at least, even if you don't go back and finish it yourself, that'll help out the next person. So it's a big cooperative kind of thing we got going here. Just an extra note on that. You will see a list of subs subscriber on the books. So that's um, usually on the right-hand side of the launch pad. If you're not seeing somebody you intend um, to email, so you can you know, use Launchpad messaging system to send them a note and it'll go to the, their subscribed email on the Launchpad. Yeah. So the next step forward is to make sure you run tests. Um, you know, of course, <laughs> assuming that you wanna contribute. <laughs> um, so each project has their own way of testing and then we have like OpenStack infrastructure system which does overall testing. Um, Docs is, you know, the testing uh, tool that we use. 
and um, we have got a good wiki on it, um, fortunately. It's a little bit old, but it still works. Um, and um, if, you're, if, if this is the first time that you're trying to run tests, um, make sure that you clone the master branch, try to run tests on that, because um, you know, that's, that's something that's been verified, and you know, that's, uh, that's something certified by OpenStack too to be able to run in most environments. Yeah, just, just a general thing. If you're, if you're gonna work on a bug and it's a new environment you just set up, just always run the tests before you start working, just to make sure that they actually do run. Because sometimes you get weird interactions or there's something missing from the Python environment or something and the tests might not run. And you don't want to discover that after you've changed some code because then you're not sure if it was your change. You want it, what you want to be sure is that when tests fail, it was your change that broke them, not something else. So that's why it's just, just a, a good thing to do. It takes, it take, depending on the project, it can you know, take up to 20 minutes to do this. But just let them rip and just make sure you've got a clean baseline before you start uh, making changes. Yeah, there's some system packages like Python dev and you know, lib uh, FFI or something like that that's usually not installed, pre-installed into a system. So, and depending on what kind of operating system, uh, you may find different sort of packages. So you, you, we cannot document all the environments or all the uh, you know, systems that uh, OpenStack will work on. So this is something that you'll have to you know, search for yourself on the internet. Of course, you know, you'll, you'll get help on IRC and you'll get help on, you know, if somebody has a, a good blog or wiki somewhere. Yeah, you can you know, use Google to see if somebody's seen the exact error that you're seeing. Um, it, most of the time, installing stuff is pretty stable, but every so often you just run into weird things. It's just like working with any other software. So um, don't be afraid to reach out for help. All right, so assuming that you have the environment set up right now, um, let's say you want to add some code. Uh, we would highly recommend using a TDD, um, and the best the best way <laughs> that's the best way you're gonna get good reviews on uh, you know your patch. Uh, once you have the tests written, make sure they fail so that you know that your code is act is doing the thing that you want to do. And um, you know we have uh, hackings and other sort of uh, requirements on the code that you publish, so you know, try to run Pepe tests as well as, if you, if you run talks in general, it's gonna do a, a, a good amount of coverage in terms of tests. Right. Yeah, so talk, talks just by itself will run all the tests that are configured for um, whatever you're working on. You can also, if you look in the talks INI file, you can see what's defined. You can run just specifically tests for Python 2.7 or just run the PEP8 tests just to make sure that the, um, to make sure that your syntax is nicely arranged the way uh, OpenStack guidelines like it. Yeah, and if you're adding docs or if you're adding release notes, um, then you, you'll have to run tests for those specific environments because those are run separately. And then the, um, the running individual tests is a useful thing because like I said, there are a lot of tests covering pretty much as much of the code as possible. So if you run all the tests, it's gonna take a long time. So if you're just focused on one particular thing that you're trying to fix, you can look at that wiki page and it'll explain exactly how to run just one particular test. It'll save you a lot of time. All right, so let's just go over a few examples on um, what tests and reviews look like and how we actually handle that. I guess before that, it's just, so you've got local tests, so you can run them right in your environment where you're making changes. After you submit the patch, the uh, continuous integration system will run tests on your code to make sure that they pass in uh, the big environment. And then when you go to, when code gets approved, there are even more tests that it goes through <laughs> to um, make sure it integrates properly with everything else. So there, there's several different stages. So you want to make sure the tests run properly in your environment, then you put stuff up, and it's possible for a test to pass in your environment and not pass on the CI. Um, and then there's, it's always exciting to try to figure out exactly <laughs> why that's the case, because they'll, they'll, you know, it's just it debugging. It is exciting. So. All right, so you know, most of the times the CI works just fine. And uh, this is one very good example of, um, that. So 
Andreas has published a, a change to the docs INI file, and uh, it's, not it's not on there. So this is Garrett. This is the interface that we use. Um, so it's, um, when you do, you make your change. You do, you commit it locally in your local local repository, and then you do git review, and then it will send it up to our CI system. And what'll happen is this gives us an interface for reviewers to look at your code. It also gives you the interface so you can see which tests have its passed, which tests it may have failed. You can see success is in green means that everything's fine. Um, the, the bars at the bottom sort of give you an idea of how complex this change is just in terms of lines of code. So it's adding green stuff and subtracting the stuff that's in, uh, in red. Um, and then in the bottom, you'll see you get a history of the patch. So it'll be people leave comments relative to particular patch sets. And then right up at the top, um, just to scroll down a tiny bit, just above the owner. Oh, no, okay. Over in the right, just by the download, you see patch sets two of two. So you can use that to display different patch sets. So you can sort of go back in history. Because what will happen is you'll leave some comments, and then somebody will, you know, the, the author, the, so if you're reviewing a patch, um, you'll leave some comments. The author will respond to them, will put up a new patch. And in the meantime, somebody else will review it, and the author may respond to that. So you need to, sometimes you need to go back in time just to see what comments were left when. Um, so there are two ways to leave comments. Some is right inside the code. So for instance, if you click on the tox INI. Yeah, just, uh, okay. Let's go over that first. Oh. Do we have comments here? Well, if you just, there okay, aren't any, but you can just show how to, yeah. Right. So this is, this is the interface. So you can see a diff from the, the base version of the code and then the change that Andreas has just submitted. Oops, I'm just trying to. Oh, and you can see up on the top now that it knows that Nikhil is the one doing the review. But this is one way you can leave comments is just like right, this is very handy, like right where you've seen something. So it's, <laughs> it'll be, <laughs> if you submit that, I wonder what he's going to think. So comments don't actually get published until you hit review on them. So you can leave drafts, and then if you save them, you can switch between devices and then the comments the comments will stay in your account. So it's true. You have to watch out for the drafts correct. because they, they persist almost forever. I finally cleared out some drafts I had from like a <laughs> two year old review. I think I might have some from the last three years. So you'll see that uh, drafts um, comments here and then. And then if you hit the reply the... button, it'll have a list. So here, since Nikhil didn't um, save the, the comment that was in line. There's nothing there. Otherwise, you'd see underneath by where the code review buttons, you'd see a list of the lines where you left comments. And then this is your overall comment. So, so usually what's going to happen is you'll go through, there'll be specific things you want to point out or make, you know, or say something about. And then you leave an overall comment just saying, you know, this, this is basically good, but I've got a few problems with the way you're, you're doing this. Or, you know, the code looks good, but there's some really bad typos. You might as well fix them right now. And then you assign, you can assign a value. You can assign a value, and depending on what access you have, you have been given, you'll have either plus one or plus two or minus one or minus two. Um, it's a good idea to have an opinion and, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I used to leave a lot of um, zeros, and then somebody pointed out to me, I'm, wasting my time. So <laughs> it's, you know, because you figure the, it's the quality of the comment that matters. But basically, one way to think about it is you should have an opinion when you're finished reviewing that it's either decent and you want to give it a plus one or there, it requires some work and you want to give it a minus one. And just explain why. Because if, if you've looked at it and you don't have anything to say, you're not really contributing much. So I, and I used to do that just because I was thinking, I don't want to really hurt somebody's feelings with a minus one. But you have to just sort of get used to it. Minus one just means that some more, you'd like to see something more happen before this thing gets merged. And so you just have to say what it is. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, so in other words, I take it that you only have so much access starting out, right? Right. So, so what happens is the, the way it works is um, 
for, I guess it's all OpenStack projects, mm -hmm. you require two core reviewers. So the core reviewers are the ones who can get plus twos. So regular people can just give plus ones or minus ones. Well, it's a practice to require two, but even just one person can. Okay. And then the workflow is only allowed for... Um, for the cores. For cores. So the workflow is where somebody, if you, so in this one you can see Nikhil's clicked one for workflow. So that's what submits the patch to the CD for everything to be checked one final time before the code gets merged into the code base. It's on the Yeah, I mean, it, de it depends on which project, but that's, that's roughly it. I mean, the idea is um, the core reviewers are people who understand the project, so they've worked around a bit. Um, they've interacted in the meetings, um, maybe have done some work as a, a uh, cross-project liaison. So with each of the projects, um, they have interactions with some of the other projects. So there's usually somebody who, who, does, who does that. Um, and for, for some, so like for security, um, it's usually a core person. Mm -hmm. But for something like documentation or something, a lot of times it's a person who's not a core reviewer. So there are various things you can do in the community to, to get yourself elevated. And one of the best things, I'm probably like preempting some of your oh, discussions. Some of the best things is, is just doing good reviews. So, because it'll start to get noticed. And the, the reviews that, are, that I really notice are ones that are minus ones, but are very thoughtful. So, and th this is a, the kind of thing where, right, you want to, um, everything that goes around comes around. So if you leave a, a nasty <laughs> comment, you're going to get them back and you're going to feel bad. So what you want to do is, is be helpful. And with, with the plus ones too, I mean, um, you know, you might look at the code and it, it seems great. And so what, what is there to say? Well, one thing you can say is just always, because sometimes when you're in a hurry, you're, I forget to do this, you want to look at the bug because usually the code is fixing a particular bug. And it's easy to get lost in just looking at the code and saying, all right, this is really beautiful, the way it's doing this looping. This is really efficient. I, li I like it. But it might not actually address the bug. So even if you leave a comment just saying, you know, I, this, you know, this code looks good and it addresses the bug, yeah. that's a really helpful thing. So it's, it's things like that are just, you want to be as helpful as possible in the reviews because what you want, and because, well, we're going to say this. I mean, what you want is to get helpful reviews yourself so that, you know, it's not just like, hey, this, you know, you got to fix this loop. You would like to know, well, what's the problem with this loop, right? Is it, why is it inefficient the way I'm, I'm doing this? So you'll see, as, as you participate, the more you share, the better experience for everybody. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my experience has been, if you help out course with their time, you're going to get good feedback from the course or efficient feedback from the course. Because um, we what, start to notice, you know, people's names, right? And if we're, if we're, you know, you're looking at, because we get this whole list, and as, so I'm, as I'm looking at the lines, I'm seeing all the other comments people have left. And you start to notice, hey, this person's making really good yeah. comments. So it's... Uh, you can save time by, you know, testing out the, the code that's published. Like, you can remove the code and see if the tests actually work, if they're failing. Uh, that's one, one thing to do, because not, not all, all the time, course will have, you know, uh, luxury to pull down every code, just you know, remove the base code and test out the <laughs> added tests. Uh, figure out if tests actually have a coverage for that code or not. Um, you know, we also look for doc good documentation and uh, proper syntax and all those things. So uh, it's just so many things to look at, and uh, just with the amount of um, reviews coming up and not having enough, uh, you know, course bandwidth to do the reviews because, you know, people timeshare and stuff like that. Um, anyone helping out with a plus one saying, oh, this, this stuff works really well, a core can, you know, come in and plus two and plus one, a uh, plus workflow, that's a really, really good uh, feedback. And, you know, that's a good way to uh, get, uh, get into the core membership because you're actually creating a positive feedback cycle within the project, within the ecosystem. That saves time and increases collaboration in the community. And if you have, um, in your local environment, you can use the git review command with minus D to just down, so if you give the number of this patch, it'll just download that and create a branch right in your local repository so you can just run things. And so if you do that and you test it out, definitely leave a comment, you know, just saying, you know, I downloaded and tested this and it seems to work. And that's always very helpful. 
Right, so just doing a time check. I think we have maybe right. a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, so do you want to go over this yes, just really quickly? All right, so yeah. maybe this is a little bit advanced and um, maybe we can let's just talk about it a little, yeah. little bit later. So let's go over the slides. We do have some general uh, ideas to share with you. Um, this is very, very, yeah. So about the codes, um, we, like, like any other uh, software project, we have our own way of doing things. Um, we'll, we'll have guidelines, we'll have project technical guide, and then we'll have different types of processes to help out with the code. But just, um, just a good practice is, you know, making sure the basics are right, right? You get the test working, you, get, you, could, uh, you have a good commit message that indicates what the code is trying to do, if the tests are there, what, they, uh, what the intent behind that is, and uh, you know, wh uh, what exactly does it address. Does it address for this particular, particular uh, release, or if it's trying to do a long-term fix, which is a part of, and your code may be a part of that, and stuff like that. So um, you know, your, a good description is always helpful in um, getting good feedback. So, of course, you want to interact with the community and get used to their way of working in the project, and you know that's how you sort of improve on collaboration as well. So, again, please use TDD. Want to talk about reviews? Well, yeah, as, as we've been saying, I mean, reviews are really important. So everything's got to be reviewed. Get two approvals from core reviewers before it's going to get merged. Um, so. Right, and code's going to get read way more than it's <laughs> written. So it's just reviewing is part of life. The only way to get your code merged is to have it reviewed, and the way to get reviews is the trade secret that Nikhil has here. Um, you got to give reviews. So you need to budget budget some time to review yep. some stuff as well as uh, you know submit patches. Um, well, the golden number is do three reviews every day. One maybe a small one. One is medium size. One is a complex one. And you sort of get brownie points for doing the reviews, and you get to learn um, using you know reviews of others, and you know as well as trying to get into the code by reviewing stuff. So that's you know it's like brushing your teeth. So. And then the, taking reviews with a grain of salt. I mean, you're going to get everybody gets minus ones and minus twos, and it's just just don't take it personally. Um, and it's right. It's, not everyone has, is share, shares a common, we all sh sort of share a common language, but we have different levels of facility in it. So people express themselves in different ways. Um, I have a friend from Finland who explained to me that there's no word for please in Finnish, and it made me understand his reviews much better. <laughs> so it's the kind of thing, just be aware that we're working in a cross-cultural atmosphere. So when you leave reviews, it doesn't hurt to say, you know, this is a good start, even if you don't believe it. But it's good, you know, this is a good start, but here are some things you need to address. And if, if there's, for nitpicky things, that can get really annoying, because you know, so when you look at the patch set, some of them have like 70 patches, right? So by the time you're working on your 70th patch, you're, you're pretty much done with this. And if somebody comes along and says, you know, in this comment, you, you switched I and E, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter. But, you know, so you can put that, always say just like a nit, because you want to say that you noticed it. And especially, you don't want to be reading stuff and notice a problem and not say anything. So if you just say nit colon, you know, this is misspelled, you, can, you don't have to minus one it if you don't want to. Um, sometimes it's, you can point some things out without minus one, but always, always be kind of nice. Just remember, if, if you make nasty comments, nasty comments are gonna come back to you. <laughs> and if you receive nasty comments, always think, well, very possibly this person didn't quite mean it that way. Right. There's a different way to do it. Because the one thing to keep in mind is when you're sitting next to somebody, right, it's easy for me to just say, hey, that's, that's a stupid move. You, you should use something else in that loop, right? And he's going to take it fine because we're sitting there looking at it. But if I write it to him and then he reads it in an email, you know, this is a stupid move, it's <laughs> kind of insulting. So just, just keep in mind, since our communication is mostly by writing, you're, you're not going to have somebody there next to you who you, you can just say, something too. So anyway, just keep that in mind. Yes? So what's the, if you're just starting out, what's the best service for work? Glance. <laughs> glance. <laughs> That's, yeah. No, I mean, glance. Serious? No, I, I'm, I'm serious because yes, um, the thing about glance is it's, it's pretty stable. Um, it's, it's a small project. It's well-defined what it does. It does have, there's some weird, interesting things about it that are, you know, so it's, it's not 
like so obvious that everybody can do it. Um, but everybody here can do it. But it just takes a little time. And, and it's, a, it's a small community. So it's, it's not like um, some of the other ones where there's so many people that you get lost. I mean, with Glance, if you show up for a couple of Glance meetings, we're going to recognize your IRC name. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a fun, it's a fun project to work on. And it's our project. So. Yeah, if people keep showing up uh, at meetings, you know, we, we welcome reviews from folks. But that may not be the case <laughs> in all the projects. <laughs> Are we um, at a time or what's our? Yeah, I think we're just a little bit over time. So let me just brush through the slides so that if people want to take pictures and then, you know, come well, back you to post, us. You can post the slides on uh, SlideShare. Um, SlideShare, stuff like that. Okay. All right, so. So there's some more good information in here. So Nikhil will post the slides on SlideShare. If you, you can ping us in IRC or by email if you have particular questions. And we'll look for all of you in the weekly glance meetings. So there are Thursdays, 1400 UTC. Um, we won't have one this Thursday because we're here. But after that, feel free to show up and uh, make contributions to glance. And you can, you can say, hey, I was at your session, so you, you should review my code. Yeah, I guess it's a good slide to end on. Yeah. Right. So, so right. So, we want open and honest communication. Um, when you're providing, yeah. you want to provide constructive criticism in a professional manner because that's what you want to get. And oh, the other thing, respect the project priority. So, projects are working on particular things we're trying to get accomplished within this cycle, and so the particular thing you're working on might not fall directly in there. So, just sort of keep that in mind that your code might sit a little bit, might not get immediate attention for reviews if there's something else that's, if, especially, particularly when we're approaching some of the milestones, we're trying to get particular stuff in. The cores have to review the things that are project priorities. So just keep that in mind. All right, thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm Brian. Um, yeah, Twitter or IRC, it's just my last name, Ross Mehta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That'd be fine. Just getting okay. I've been coding in Python for like five, six years. Oh, okay. Then. Uh, well, actually, longer than two times, but. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, the project of this size. Oh, it'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and OpenStack has its quirks. I guess I'm still mic'd. Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's good. No, it keeps it running.